Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to the 2019 Waste Expo session, How to Achieve and Maintain Operational Efficiencies. My name is Michael O'Connor, I'm the owner and managing partner with Premier Waste Services and I'll be moderating this session. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists for the session. To my immediate left is Bart Powell. Bart's a Division Vice President with Waste Connections uh, for the Arizona market. He's the founder of Right Away Disposal and most recently sold his business to Waste Connections about two years ago. Uh, Kevin Atkinson, always wanted to be a garbage man growing up. Started on the back of a truck during summer break uh, from college at WCA back in 2005. Got uh, his CDL and drove following uh, holiday breaks and summers for year uh, 2006 and seven. Graduated in 20, 2008 and uh, brought on with WCA as a trainee. He took over a small municipal contract fall of 08, uh, and took over the WCA residential division for Houston in 2009. Became the assistant GM for Houston area in 2011 and left in July of 2013 to start Texas Pride Disposal by acquiring a small company in Southwest Houston. Started with 1,200 subscription customers and now servicing about 160,000 with another 104,000 starting in February uh, with a recycling collection contract with the city of Houston. <laughs> B.J. Harvey, Executive Vice President with E.L. Harvey and Sons. Benjamin James uh, brings a new perspective to an ever-changing industry. B.J. started uh, working at E.L. Harvey and Sons part-time in his high school years. B.J. graduated from Fairfield University's Dolan School of Business in 2001 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Management. Uh, at E.L. Harvey, he's helped expand the computer and electronic business. BJ has worked very closely in electronic recycling, as well as document destruction in accordance with HIPAA regulations. He is currently actively involved in the acquisitions integration process at E.L. Harvey and Sons. And to his left is William Safera, Senior Vice President, Special Projects for Advanced Disposal. Joined the company in 2015. He oversees company initiatives and projects in the Southwest, excuse me, Southeast across multiple lines of business. Billy has 25 years of industry experience and most recently served as the Central Region Vice President of Operations with Republic Services. We've got four very interesting uh, pieces that we're going to touch on today. Technology, workforce av availability, safety, and everybody's favorite, distractive driving. With advanced routing capabilities, instant data capture, and driver behavior tracking, everyone's looking to leverage technology and make their operations more efficient, more cost effective, all while giving better customer service. So let's, uh, let's talk to you guys. What are some efficiencies you're focused on improving and how is the technology you're using impacting your day-to-day -day operations? Um, I'll start with that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of, that covers a lot of ground, um, but I'll, I'll highlight two things. And um, one is focus above and beyond the, like the route efficiencies you can get with, with, te with technology. Um, we focus on service verification, which is Auto, auto location, geocoding, and um, actuation. So you're in this place at this time and an event happens. Um, it's a measure of service effectiveness for us and um, allows customer service personnel to deal much more effectively with, with customers. I was there, how can we better service you? And with photographic evidence, how can I serve you better? So secondly, um, travel path effectiveness. So, so with uh, breadcrumb trails, um, telling them where we went. Um, we give our folks uh, a travel path of where they should go. When we measure both of those things together along with like density comparative analysis, KPIs, gives us a really effective coaching tool to kind of improve both the 
time we, we give customer service and how effectively we do it. So those are kind of two things we really look for with that kind of technology. Yeah, for us, it's, it's um, right-sizing containers. Just, just piggybacking on the customer service piece, it's, it's right-sizing containers. Um, so, you know, we use cameras and stuff. So when a, when a, if you're doing the front load business and there's continual overflow where we're jumping out to, to pick up extra yards from a sales perspective and customer service, it's right-sizing that container. On the residential side, it's, it goes back to the service piece. We're more efficient because if we drive by we know we were there it's as, as Billy talked about um, you know we don't have to go back and get that we can say that we know our truck was there at seven o'clock we, we, we have it via this data and we don't have to go back and pick it up it'll it'll wait till next week so a couple things that help us <clears throat> same boat uh, the the routing efficiency itself the breadcrumbs uh, kind of laying out the uh, the structure of our overall routes uh, we've also looked at it uh, residentially on our subscription and individually build areas um, <clears throat> rather than just a, a paper cutoff sheet for our crews uh, utilizing uh, route software that is on a tablet for our, 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 our drivers who while they're going through that community they've got uh, 900 green check marks and 100 red check marks and they know right then and there uh, 215 <clears throat> service this house 216 didn't service this house on stop service. Um, so not just the efficiency of the uh, collection itself, but the the, the true collections uh, side of it on the finance piece for us. Yeah, and just my colleagues touched base on uh, a lot of the aspects of the technology for the routing systems. And another thing that we use it for is obviously safety of that stop. Um, we've all been out there with routes or when we get on a truck and you... A lot of times the drivers relay back to us what they're doing, and but you can actually go back and review that video clip or live video that, you know, there's a road they shouldn't even be going down, you know, from overlapping it to get the route efficiencies done. But we use a lot of it to realize there's just some customers that, you know, where they want to place their container that we're not willing to service it there because it needs to be brought out where we can safely service that container. So we're using a lot of that technology for that. too. Well, coming from a truck myself, um, how has your driver uh, buy-in been with the uh, routing systems? Um, you know, a lot of times they feel that, you know, they can do it better. They can, uh, you know, they, they don't want to be big brother or anything. How, is, uh, how has your buy-in been? Is it something where you've needed to uh, show them uh, you know, through the advancement of it? Uh, how, how have you got the engagement with them to uh, trust in the process? I'll start with that one there. A lot of it is, like Michael had said, you know, being a driver myself through the years and you always find a way that, well, I know better that computer's not going to tell me how to do it. And a lot of times, you know, when you're physically out there and know which side the can is, which side the street, the computers can't dictate all that for us. So a lot of it, it's not, but we've had great luck with the drivers when we're doing a reroute we bring the driver in and we let them put their input in on how that route needs to be ran and it gives them a buy-in to why we're doing it and how we're doing it but it's gonna you know it's it's hard making time to get the driver in to do that but with the new technology that's out there you can overlay it real quick and say if we start your route here and you're going to finish here where you're going to have a landfill stop here or a transfer station stop here and once they buy into it it's been working out great for us from, from our standpoint, my biggest concern was the actual buy-in of it. Um, going from a, a paper map uh, to a, a, a tablet in the in the cab, um, unsure if the drivers themselves would be interested in using it, capable of using it. Um, but we found that uh, our team was extremely excited uh, in demoing them. Um, extremely excited about adding the technology to the trucks um, where I think there was a lot of fear that it would make things more complicated for our guys. It actually made it a lot simpler. Um, so overall, the buy-in, uh, even to myself, I was somewhat surprised how excited our team was to, uh, to put these tablets into our, into our trucks. So for us, it, it, getting away from the, the tablets for a minute and focusing on the camera system, I'm not sure how many people use, you know, whatever it's drive camera, third eye or whatever that is. Um, to, to, you know, and that's a real big brother thing because there's a seven cameras on the trucks, you know, inside, outside, and everything like that. So to get the buy-in from that was challenging at first, but the first incident that uh, saved a driver's job and, and reversed a, a, a lawsuit against us, uh, it's, it's funny how everybody started to jump on board pretty quickly after that. So... Um, you know, that was the, the real mover when, from people not liking it to people liking it was the first incident that went the other way. People really started to buy into it. And they're like, oh, this actually does work for my benefit. So, 
And just to add to that, they're all absolutely correct. Um, I, I'll make it simple. If you're, if you're looking to use cameras that photograph people, what they're doing, folks just don't like that right off the bat. But kind of the, the demarcation line is if supervisors or managers do a really good job explaining why, why we're doing this, what's the value for you in doing this, then um, you get by. That is almost as simple as that. Why are we doing this and make them part of the process. If you use it as a disciplinary hammer and you use the technology even once or twice or three times, you know, you use it for discipline and coaching, but if you use it as a hammer, you'll, you'll get no buy-in and it'll be actually be a detriment. And I'll add this for you folks in um, the West and in the, in the Midwest, if you are not employing this kind of technology and you're thinking about it, and there's a, we'll, we'll be talking about it quite a bit here, one thing you gotta consider is if you've got a collective bargaining agreement and you have anything to do with unions at all, um, that's got to be part of your negotiation. You make sure you bring that up in the forefront because that'll become a huge issue if you just spring it. If you're doing it during during a, a current collective bargaining agreement, you know through the through the normal channels, um, your business agent, and so forth, bring it up. They're used to it, especially if you know the, the teamsters or the operating engineers. They're used to it. You know they've had these things um, um, be part of these agreements, but you know it's, it becomes almost. Um, I'll warn you about this. It becomes a quid pro quo quid pro quo, you get that, they're going to want something back. So it's a major issue. As you're making the decision, consider that, okay? Fantastic. With today's challenges in hiring and retaining quality employees, it's hard to stay ahead of the race. Everyone is looking to hire qualified drivers and mechanics from the same thinning pool. What are some things your company is doing to get in front of the, uh, in front of the, the issue of, of trying to to locate drivers, trying to bring drivers in to, to be interested in a, in a career path. What uh, what are some things that you're doing to, to get in front of that? Who wants to tackle that one? I want to listen because I have some <laughs> ideas. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start. We, uh, we, we've tried uh, basically a multi-prong approach on this. Um, we, uh, with drivers that come in with experience, we, uh, we typically honor whatever experience they have. So our company is six years old and we've got a driver that's got 30 years of experience with us. Um, he had 29 years at waste management. He's been with us for a year. Um, that seems to go a long way. Uh, we, uh, if our if our current employees bring employees on uh, that last at least three months with us, uh, we incentivize that. Um, depending on the quality and, and the experience of the person they bring on, uh, kind of dictates the uh, the amount that we incentivize them with. Um, and our our company culture. Um, Coming from, uh, we, we've got Waste Management and Republic and, and WCA, some large corporate companies in our market. We try to have a very relaxed environment as, as far as the, uh, uh, just the culture itself. Uh, we, do, uh, we do barbecues at least every quarter for our guys. Um, we, uh, we have a safety program uh, that incentivizes them quarterly. Uh, we do uh, uh, monthly safety meetings in which if we've got a compliment that comes in through, we'll surprise them with a, uh, a gift card for uh, Walmart or uh, you know, a restaurant of some type. Um, so kind of keeping our guys on our toes, always keeping a, a carrot out in front of them uh, has created a culture where uh, it's almost turned into our, our team does more recruiting than we actually do out in the street. Um, it's worked very well for us. We've had very rapid growth over the last year, two years, three years, um, essentially doubling in size three straight years. So trying to keep up with that growth has been uh, a tremendous challenge for us. But given, given the, uh, uh, the current market for the labor, um, I think the way we've approached it has done a very good job of keeping up with our growth. For, I mean, for us, it's it's we do we do a tremendous amount of advertising to try to get drivers in. I mean, obviously, everybody knows that the unemployment rate is so low. Um, with states continuing to legalize marijuana, I mean, that, that throws a whole another challenge into the whole deal, um, where you know we have to follow the federal guidelines. So, if people f fail a drug test, which obviously we give, um, you know, that's become a, 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 an issue. Um, but we do a lot of advertising. We do billboards. We do radio ads. Um, we have referral bonuses, and then you know. I mean, 
mean, so drivers are one piece of it, maintenance is the other piece. Uh, and that's gonna continue to be more and more difficult because people just aren't going to school um, to, to, to be mechanics anymore. So, you know, you really need a really good dealer network because trucks break down, they break down <laughs> often and a lot. Uh, and, you know, you need a good dealer network that's, that's close, that's local, and that can service those trucks because, you know, uh, we've basically just turned into a PM company now uh, and, and, and sub out all the big jobs. So you really need somebody local to, to help you with that. Yeah, it, it keeps getting, I mean, we're all going through trying to find good good help, good drivers, good mechanics. I mean, you look back at the high schools. They've pulled all the shop classes. You know, you, don't, you can't even do that in high schools no more. So when you get this younger generation out there that knew they liked working with their hands or worked in auto shop or anything else, it's not even there. You have to go to a trade school now to even find out if you like that. So we do a lot with mentoring programs. Um, we send out staff at the high schools, uh, we referral with the drivers. If they get somebody, we do you know sign on bonuses, but a lot of it's the referral because your drivers and your own employees know who they want to come work because they're not going to recommend somebody that's not going to do a good job because it makes them have to work harder. So we've had good luck with the referral programs with these drivers. Yeah, I'd agree with the, the best folks we, we get anywhere are through referrals. So those are the, the most solid employees we get. So it kind of starts with taking care of the people you got, right? And make sure they, because they're not going to give a referral. Uh, if I could digress for one second, my bio was a little bit dated. I've been doing this for about 30 years. Um, my, how the world has changed in 30 years for these folks that have been doing this for a long time. I can remember a time, you know, 89, 88, when this job itself was, um, there was a disparity. When we paid a, not necessarily an unskilled, very skilled worker, but not somebody that didn't necessarily have a lot of education, perhaps couldn't even read, what they could make in our industry compared to everything else, there was a huge disparity. I mean, they could work for us, I was at BFI at the time, they could make you know, huge amount of time, sixty thousand dollars, seventy. You know, way more than I was making as a supervisor. You know, I made more as a driver than as a supervisor. But that gap is is has diminished. There's not a big gap. Um, way more people go to secondary education. You know, thirty percent of people went to college back then. I remember something like sixty percent now. So. I say all that to say this. I mean, there, there's there's no stone you should leave unturned. We're in multiple markets. Us, you're in single market, same kind of dynamics. So, what we try and do first of all is, you know, competitive market wage surveys. You know, if we can pay 10% more than like people, then hopefully you get people that'll give you 15% more. We're trying to look in a lot of non-traditional places. So, I mean, everybody everybody knows this. Military transition is a really good place to find garbage folks. Um, Farmers, um, FFA, those kind of places. If you don't know this, farm kids and young farm people make terrific garbage men. They can do everything. They know about hydraulics. You know, if they come from outside other trucking, they don't know that kind of, you know, how the equipment interacts. And then, and then one other place, and I'll, I'll shut up, is church groups. And the reason I say church groups is um, a lot of a lot of migrant folks who are extremely good workers, very skilled. Come a lot of them come through church groups. We have found at different places that is a, a really fertile area to find good employees, and then you got to kind of grow your own and make sure you give them some of the training and skills to do good jobs. But that's you know just a couple of the places we've looked. So piggybacking on that as well, we've had a lot of success with long haul truckers. Uh, with that pay gap that's diminished. Um, people can actually stay home every night, go home to their family. Yeah, exactly. So with a little bit of training, we've actually, three of our best drivers are, are guys that were sick of being gone three, four weeks of the month and uh, have come to work for us and, again, some of our best drivers. You know, for us, when we were putting Premier Waste together, one of the things that we focused on was uh, putting together a, a health benefits package, you know, that, that, that would rival any of the national companies, uh, trying to, you know, draw the talent to come on board. Because um, you're, you're talking to a guy and interviewing a guy that 20 years at one of the national companies, I mean, why are they going to want to leave? They've got fantastic benefits, uh, usually very competitive pay. Uh, there's got to be something that you're offering. Why, why are they wanting to come talk to you? Um, so have, have you guys seen uh, employees focus uh, as much on the health care uh, you know, package that you're offering over the, the hourly? Or are you seeing their, their focus still, you know, what am I paid an hour? I think it goes, you know, there's... 
two different aspects you're looking at. You get the young drivers that don't have a family yet. They don't care as much about the insurance. They just want to know what they're going to make. And then you get the more seasoned employee that's got a family. Yeah, he's looking more at those health benefits. So we've done a lot of uh, analysts and looking at what bringing that cost down that the we pay more for their benefits up front to reduce those costs way down. And we've had a huge uh, uptick in that with lowering the health insurance costs. Yeah. And, and PTO time. I mean, it's that's you offer, you know, vacation time, even though as a garbage truck driver, it's hard to have a replacement or backup driver for vacation time. But we've had to offer it because we all need to spend some time with our families. And that's paying off to having a culture of, hey, we care about everyone. Everyone needs time to be away from work and to be home with their families. But we've had to do a lot of adjustments, obviously, hiring more people for swing drivers to help fill some of that. Sure. Yeah, I think it, it just depends on the dependence, you know, and, and, and what, what people are looking for. To piggyback on that, I mean, we, this is the first year we've ever offered two different tier programs, a high deductible and a low deductible. Um, and so, you know, obviously the, the, the younger folks without any without any children that, that want more in their paycheck and want to pay and pay less on their insurance side, they're, they're obviously going with the, you know, with the higher deductible program. And, and then you have that other offset for the people that, you know, that have children and, and, uh, and, and or have dependents and, uh, and, and want the comfort of knowing that if something, God forbid, something happens, that they have a good, a good program. So I guess it just depends. We were in uh, somewhat of a unique position with our uh, insurance program with the, uh, with our workforce. We have a, a predominantly Hispanic workforce. So a lot of our guys uh, will send a lot of money back home to their families in Central and South America. When we went to put a program in place, we were a uh, dog chasing our own tail. The insurance company wanted to know how many employees we would have enrolled in it. Uh, we gave them a ballpark number. We would go back to our employees with the ballpark price and that number would drop by half and we'd go back to the insurance company and say, it's actually this and then give us a price. And after three or four times of that, um, our insurance company looked at us and said, why don't we do this? Um, why don't you guys put a MEC program in place, minimal essential, minimum essential coverage, uh, meets all the Affordable Care Act uh, requirements, and we could gauge for a year uh, the usage of our uh, program. And so we did that. Uh, it's self-funded. Um, the cost is uh, about 60% less than what a traditional program would be. Um, and it worked for our employees. Uh, when we had employees that would come to us and say, hey, this drug, it's not covered. Can we do anything about that? Um, we simply make a phone call to our uh, uh, carrier and say, can we add this? Yes or no. Um, they tell us ballpark what it's going to cost us uh, to carry it. And we make the decision ultimately. Um, we, we pay into the program every month. We've got a surplus of about $30,000 in the, uh, the account right now. Um, for us, again, a unique workforce, uh, but also a unique solution for it. Uh, it's, it's worked very well for us. I echo everything you said. We're trying to do the same kind of things. Um, whether or not it matters, um, almost exclusively a domain of the demographic makeup of your workforce, you know, the age and, 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 and all those things. Uh, I will say in the last probably three or four years, especially with the younger workforce, the first question that we get asked anymore is about PTO. How much, when, how soon, because that's, that's what's important, right? They're not as worried about family benefits, but they're really worried about their, their time and when, when I can do it and how often. And um, strangely enough, um, FMLA, they, they want to know, you know, how do you operate and handle FMLA, which is the wrong question to be asking, right? But um, you got to deal with it. This kind of things that, um, especially the younger f workforce, is focused on. So. Sure, sure. I mean, if you had, and you just you flip back to um, getting drivers, we you know we, we touched on that earlier. I mean, that's another thing too. We we've, we've beefed up our vacation policy to get people in the door. So before you know, if it was a you know a, a week after a year, or whatever the situation is, we've we've basically doubled it, and now are even letting uh, letting good drivers, long term drivers, dictate a little bit more. So if they're leaving one company to come to ours, we try to match the, their vacation plan yeah, that they had. So. What about quality of equipment? Have you uh, tried to get a driver on and, and that been a concern of theirs? You know, what type of equipment am I gonna be driving? You get your 20 year guy from waste management. Obviously he's probably had uh, at least maybe two brand new trucks in his 20 years. 
uh, you know, are, are they are they wanting to kind of see what they're getting into, uh, you know, versus some some fleets tend to be a little bit aged and maybe I'm not going to get a newer truck for a while, or is that anything that's coming into play? I, I'd say sure it matters. I mean, it, it certainly does. And I, in my experience, though, and you guys may have a different experience, the bells and whistles aren't what matters so much as comfort and reliability. They sure. want to know their own truck is going to start every day. Sure. You know. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. I think it matters. It's it's pretty neat with with all the social media stuff when um, you give somebody a new truck and they take pictures. There's there, there's more pictures of the truck than their family uh, on their Facebook account. I mean, that's that's pretty cool to see. So yeah, absolutely, it matters. Yeah, our, our fleet, we're, we're fortunate with the growth again. Uh, the average age of our fleet isn't even a year old. Um, but we, we've literally had guys come in and, and we asked them how they heard of us or why they came in and applied with us. And they said, oh, I saw the truck going down the freeway with the windows up. It means you have AC. So yeah, It does. It plays a, a, a big part on getting employees and keeping employees. Because you always got to figure when you're hiring a new employee, well, they're normally the ones that get the older trucks. So it's almost changing that because a lot of them, well, I don't want the older truck. I want to drive the new truck. Well, it's kind of getting past that having a more up-to-date fleet because again it's getting harder to find drivers and if you have an old truck and you tell them you're going to drive the old one until you get some experience sometimes you know they work and you know it's the onboarding and everything else but a lot of times they they want to jump right from that older truck to the newer truck so it is it's a challenge for sure for sure refuge and recyclable material collection excuse me collectors continues to be the fifth most dangerous occupation in america from technology to company grown safety programs, everyone's working to get our industry off of this list. Um, I mean, you guys, this is something we've been talking about for, for years now. Uh, I'm on committees with a lot of you. Uh, what is your company doing, uh, you know, to, to get out in front of safety? I mean, I, with uh, Waste Connections, I mean, their number one core value is safety. So it's everyone's responsibility and it's, when you talk and it's everyone's responsibility if they see something unsafe uh, at the tailgate meetings, it's neat to see some of our workforce. If a visitor comes on the site and they don't have a safety vest on, you know, it's not just sit there and say that's not my, my responsibility, but it's cool watching everyone buy into it that, you know, everyone has a family, uh, a son, a daughter, a wife, grandkids that are out there. And it's the whole aspect of letting them buy in. It's not just it was an accident. Can it be prevented? everything can be prevented and it's getting them to buy into it that hey that could be your wife or your kids that are out there and it's really neat having them come in and a lot of our tailgate meetings we let them tell a story of what they saw out there on the street so we let all of them buy into it because it is it's all our responsibility we uh again it, it, it goes back to culture um safety is not something you can just tell somebody uh, it's a culture that we've built um, we literally started from, from the ground up. We, uh, in 2015, uh, had a three week window where we had a fire, uh, burned up a quarter of the fleet, uh, woke up on a Sunday morning to a bunch of pictures and text messages of four burned out trucks in our parking lot. Um, and then three weeks later we had a fatality. Uh, we had a driver that hydroplaned, wasn't wearing a seatbelt, rolled the truck, ejected from it, uh, killed at the scene. Um, so we, uh, uh, coming from WCA, it was always uh, a big uh, piece of our uh, culture there. Um, and realizing that we, uh, with the growth we were coming into and, and just what we were trying to, to achieve, um, realized very quickly that we had to change things very quickly. Um, fast forward to last year on our insurance renewal, we were sitting with our insurance carrier and uh, our, our workers' comp spend was 6% of our premium last year. And I asked our insurance carrier what they typically shoot for on that. And they said, usually where we like to see it as the carrier is 70%. So we were 64% under uh, what they were shooting for. Um, we've done a tremendous job. We've got a safety director in place. We, uh, as, as small as we were when we put that position in place, I think it's, it's the reason that we've per performed so well. Uh, over the last few years, that that six percent spend ratio has been. This will be our third consecutive year at the pace that we're on. Um, uh, that it's as, as small as it's been. Uh, knock on wood. Um, but it's 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 just so crucial. And and when your team sees you fully committed to to what they're doing in the field every day, um, going above and beyond the safety stand downs when there is an incident or you catch somebody doing something that could potentially become an incident. 
Um, again, the, uh, the quarterly safety bonuses that we do, it doesn't have to be anything massive. Um, it just shows that you really are committed to not just the safety, but these guys' lives out in the field, working on the backs of these trucks, working in these big trucks. Um, it, it does go a long way. And, it, and again, it's, it's not something that you'll have put in place in a month. It takes time to build that culture. But once you have it there and you maintain it, um, it just, it's, uh, again, you can use that as a recruiting tool. Yeah. I mean, you know, for us, we, we, we talk about growth. So in the past five years, we've grown the company. Um, we doubled the size of the company. So when you, when you grow kind of that quickly, as Kevin was talking about earlier, there's a lot more opportunity for things to go wrong. So our safety record, um, you know, was, was, was adding by about 15%. So the incidents were adding by about 15% every year for three years until our insurance carrier finally came to us and said, here's the deal. We're not going to insure you in, unless you put cameras in your trucks. So, um, you know, they actually forced the safety issue. I mean, we preached it, we preached it, we preached it, but you got to have buy-in from, from the people that are actually on the road or in the buildings doing it. Um, and ever since we put um, Third Eye in, uh, about a year ago, we've seen about a 30% reduction in incidents. So our premiums have continued to escalate, but as, you know, as everybody goes, it's a three-year three rolling. So, um, you know, we should start to see those go the other way. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the cameras in the truck was, it was a huge move for us uh, and has been unbelievably valuable. Uh, great stuff, by the way, all those. I mean, I think really authentic, every one of them. Um, I'll try not to cover the same ground. Obviously agree with what they said, but um, we're going to talk about technology a little bit in a few minutes, but practical technology and the right technology for one is a good way to go. I'd say um, it's important to have a message and a consistent message and an authentic message. And, um, Having a bunch of posters with somebody else's slogan on it is not it. You know, you can spend a lot of money on that. You know, but a lot of people will give you, you know, those pictures with people rowing and all that kind of stuff. If you put those up on the wall and it's not really a message, it doesn't, you just wasted a lot of money. So, you know, so, so what's the message? I mean, there's a lot of really good messages, but I think the most important one is throughout your organization, if you, if you do this well, and it's hard to get it kind of permeated everywhere, is that I care. And I care about the important stuff, and the important stuff is your family. I'm not talking about just profit and all that kind of stuff, but your family. If you're, if you're getting that culture down to the supervisor level, that that's the kind of conversations they're having in the morning and the afternoon, I mean, I, that's, that's permeated culture. That means, yeah, our, 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 our goals converge because I'm not sending you to Afghanistan. I expect you to come back alive with all your digits and safe. I mean, that, that's, that's part of what you should be doing, and I think... Um, one of the other things from an action standpoint is trying to remove hazards, you know, kind of reevaluating what you're doing, how you're servicing, you know, pinch points and, you know, the Murph kind of stuff we do here. But what I mean by that is, you know, if you're, if you're doing a lot of manual work and you can afford to do it and your customers will do it, you know, going from that to automation removes a lot of hazards. If um, you're talking about high biz a lot, you know, boy, how many of you had that experience where you just had that safety meeting where you talked about gloves and high vis and vests and everybody's, yeah, I got it. And you go down the street and there they are. No high vis, no gloves, you know, reaching into the hopper. So as much as you can do to remove that stuff, incorporate high vis and all that into your uniform. I mean, it, so it don't have a choice and require that everybody wears a uniform. Um, and I, I guess the last thing is electronics, and we're going to talk about this, electronics as a way to remove hazards, electronics defeating technology. And there are plenty out there. It takes a lot of work, and I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to that. But, you know, removing that hazard of the electronics distracting, and it's a discipline, and, it, and there's some legal issues with it. But, you know, actually going down the road of instead of just telling them don't do this, you know, try, try to remove those things, you know, try to remove this as much as you can. I think that's probably I don't know who touched on it earlier, but you know it's it's a sales function too, <clears throat> to making sure that your salespeople are educated and not putting your drivers in, in bad spaces. You know we've done a really good job of putting our operations and our sales team together. So if there's even a question, low hanging wires, tight spaces, whatever, you know that's stuff that we're we're now walking away from as as a sales group. Um, so that's you know a, a, a key piece of it as well. Definitely, not all business is good business. Yeah. How uh, how do you uh, engage your veteran drivers? Um, to lead by example uh, for the new hires. You touched earlier, Bart, about uh, you know them, you know having uh, 
visitors come on and if they didn't have the vest, you know, bring into to their attention, you know, how, how do you, how do you, you know, cause obviously we've got our 20 year and our 30 year drivers, but you know, we're going to have just a, just a high percentage of, of new folks that are coming in that, that don't really have any experience. And so, you know, as we've got the last bit of the, of the veteran guys, how do, how do you get them to engage uh, and, and, and lead by example? And it's just that it's letting your veteran and your guys that have been there for a while, they're, they're examples for the new guys coming on. And it's, you know, getting in front of your supervisors and your managers and letting those lead drivers and those veteran drivers know that they are a teacher, whether they want to be or not, they are looked up to. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's like anything else, getting them to buy into their need to teach, you know, the younger generation how to do their job that they do so well, do it safely. And again, and it's that buy in and that culture to let them know that we want you to go home at the end of the day. You need to listen to your mentor and we team them up with them. But we got a lot of our senior drivers that, you know, they actually enjoy um, being the, the trainer for the younger guys because they get to give them some of their knowledge and their stories. I mean, when they're training, they're riding around in the cab of that truck for 10 hours a day. They, they get to spew out a lot of that knowledge that they've had over the years. And it's, it's really helped in a long way for our new guys on the onboarding. Yeah. Very similarly, we, we utilize ours as, as lead drivers and, and uh, training drivers. Um, we've we've been hiring so much uh, for the last four or five months that we've got a few that are literally full time trainers. Always somebody new in the cab. Um, uh, but again, being able to utilize them in that role and, and share what they've uh, learned over their career with uh, these long haul drivers that don't know anything about the truck young drivers um we truthfully put all of our drivers through so even if you do come in with 30 years of experience our waste management driver uh he got to ride around and they probably told war stories um but uh we uh with our veteran guys uh we we utilize them and incentivize them in the uh in that uh, lead and, and training role it's such an interesting dynamic, right? Because um, you, you got to really make your veteran guys feel appreciated for, for their service. Um, because now you, we, we touched on it earlier about how, how trying to get good drivers and new drivers in. I mean, theoretically, you could, a guy who's been with you for 30 years might be making the same as a guy who's been with you for like three, uh, you know, and it, so that's, that's a real big challenge, uh, you know, that we're facing. And I think it just comes down to make, making sure that our veteran guys feel really appreciated, um, that they're really helping us um, in, in the training piece and everything like that. But it sure is, it's, it's more and more difficult, um, you know, as, as the hiring process is, is as well. So. Yeah. And I really can't add anything to that other than I'll use a word I use for the third time and that's, um, Authentic. You got to be authentic and truthful about value. Why, why we're doing this again? Never, never hurts to bring people in on the why. And um, when you earn that trust, then um, you know that's kind of the definition of buy-in, right? So you need to back them up to if you're going to allow people to do things, you need to allow them to make mistakes and back them up support them when they do that. So Bart and I just had dinner last night, and we're discussing. Uh, 30 year employee making the same thing as the three year employee and yeah. the challenges that come with that. So it was interesting that you touched on that. Um, you know, what technology are, uh, are you using and how has it moved the needle uh, for your company? Um, you know, are, are, are you, are you using anything other than a, a drive cam or a third eyes or is there any other system or product that you're, you're demoing or looking into? Yeah. Well, um, in addition to driving drive cam and third eye, which we, we have on every truck, um, we're piloting now. I've actually got it in three or four locations. Um, Zella, is everybody familiar, anybody familiar with Zella? It's a web-based communication device. Um, still working through it, and um, it's actually had a lot of um, promise for us. Um, but what I like about it is I can defeat the electronic. So the truck's moving. Um, they can't use a communication device. Um, if, if a dispatcher needs to talk to them through Zello, if you're familiar with it, they'll send a message and when he stops the truck, it, blows, it gets below five miles an hour, the message will come to him. So as opposed to traditional communication devices, sure. um, we'll use Zello. Kind of in the, along the same lines, if I have tablets in the truck, or if we're allowing folks to use um, droids or cell phones in the truck for communication, then um, we're requiring in these pilot locations some illegal stuff here too. So I, you don't really need, not a big deal, but um, we're requiring them if they're carrying a phone of any set or a communication device in these pilot spots that we put cell control 
on their droid or their phone. So they can't use it if the truck's moving five miles an hour. So again, trying to remove that distracted driving piece in addition to all the benefits of drive cam and third eye brain. How has the buy-in been on that? As far as, I mean, immediately it had to, this is my personal cell phone. You're telling me I have to disable it. How was the, uh, how was, how was that? It, it, it meets with a lot of resistance. Sure. I mean, there's a big brother aspect of all that. Um, I, and I, there's a question about this, but I'll tell you that way we try and approach it. And again, it's a smaller group for us right now. We're trying to communicate, <coughs> express it. What we're not, what we're trying to do is first save your life. Sure. That's a terribly important message. But with all these things, I'm not trying to catch you at your worst. Right. That's not the point here. Okay. Right. It's to help you train to be at your best. Sure. So, so if it becomes part of your progressive coaching, if you want to call it discipline, mm -hmm. then I can catch you two or three times before we have a catastrophic incident and we can talk about it and I value you. I mean, what's the most important stat we deal with? Turnover. Okay. It kind of drives everything else. If you can message that, that this is a methodology to make sure you have a very long career with this and you're, again, authentic about that, then it, yeah, but initially, oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, that's just one more thing, right? Sure. But we've sure. had pretty good success once, you know, 30, 60, 90 days. They get it mm -hmm. so far. Do you feel this is something you guys are going to continue to roll out? Are you, are you, I'm not at liberty to discuss what's going to happen more than six weeks. Up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah I, I would say that this is um, kind of in our, has been in our strategic plan, sure. even going up two and three years. So we have already kind of um, placed out, out there in our strategic plan when we would deploy these devices and where. How'd you find the system? Um, purchasing. I have a, a, a wizard of a purchasing guy that's um, high tech and um, has a background in tech engineering as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, set him loose and said, go find us something. So he's, he's right. kind of, it's all available. You got a bunch of folks here who can tell you about it. I'm sure, sure. walk the floor. They got it out there too. Mm -hmm. so. Sure. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I touched on it earlier. Um, you know, we, we use third eye in our trucks and, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's reduced our incidents by about 30% in, in a one year period. So, um, a lot of success with that. I think, uh, you know, I think the, the technology is, is uh, a tremendous asset to have, uh, but I also think you can't lose sight of uh, the human aspect to it. Um, uh, the technology can assist, but a supervisor or a safety manager, operations manager, owner rolling up on a crew that is not in their safety vest or uh, zigzagging down the street, uh, going down the road without the seatbelt on, that human element of always being able to, we try to get out and do an observation on every single route we run once a month. And those guys don't know if we're going to be out there and see them, um, but they know that we're coming to see them. Um, and so keeping that in the back of their mind as well, as much as the technology assists with that, I think keeping that, that human element uh, in touch with it is, is crucial as well. Yeah, it's a, it's been a real challenge when we rolled out third eye in our trucks and it, it, it comes down to the buy-in. Yeah, you know, it's not big brothers watching. We're looking to get you and get you in trouble for what you're doing. Um, obviously we've had more times than somebody has been disciplined and we get both sides where you I mean you could get some of these pictures and you can't believe what he was doing inside that truck and you're glad you caught it. Um, but it's also been there and it's saved so many of them where the car pulled out in front of them and no, it was not the driver's fault. It saved us an insurance claim, saved us a lot of expense. But the coaching to it, it's not, and you bring them in. We had one guy, veteran driver, been driving for 30 years. He'd been doing the same thing every day and we were watching the video of it. It was just a coaching. It was basically block vision. And we're watching the video and it was really cool to sit there and see him. He was kind of irritated that we even brought him in. But he had those big 44-ounce mugs that you see, which half of us have every day. And he didn't use the straw. And every time you look at the camera, he picked that big mug up and he was taking a drink. Completely blinded his vision of that road. It was so cool to sit there and have him go, I've been using a mug like that for 30 years. And I never realized I was blind that moment I was drinking. To this day, he uses a straw. He still has his mug. He just uses a straw because he doesn't take his eyes off that road. But he was a great driver. He's never been in an accident and anything else. But it took that moment just to realize in the coaching and the buy into it that, hey, we want you to be safe, that he realized, wow, there's something I learned from this. So. I, I, and I already talked about it. I'll talk again. That's a terribly important point. And don't forget, 
it's kind of like incentive systems don't manage for you. You know, they're, they're a tool to help you manage people. Don't forget there's people in, in this whole deal. The electronics don't manage for you. They do exactly what you're talking about. If Focus on behaviors, not, you know, I'd rather have that conversation with the 30 year driver than, you know, go talk to his wife, right? I mean, exactly. it's a really good point to make with them when you're having that. So I'd rather catch it then and have that conversation as a conversation as opposed to showing them the door or the, you know, the worst case scenario. It, it, still people though, right? People exactly. driving the trucks and people doing yep. people things. Yeah, we're all human. We're all gonna make mistakes. It's just like, say if we, as long as we learn from our mistakes, that's the key. We have third eye in our equipment as well. And uh, I had a driver at a transfer station um, back into another uh, competitor uh, roll off truck. And we were able to use uh, the technology to show him exactly what happened, you know, uh, because when he called, he says, you know, I, I, you know, I looked. And so, you know, from before, you just have to take his word for it. I mean, but now we were able, we were in the cab and he never looked in either mirror. And, you know, this is, this is a gentleman that's got two young girls. I said, you know, you and the wife and the kids are at Target and you're backing out. Do you look or do you just put it in reverse and hope for the best? And, you know, so it was, it really helped him see what he did. Uh, you know, and I, I love that about the piece. Yeah, me too. You know, we, before we were never, you know, you talk about 30 year career, yeah. you know, going back to, you know, the eighties, we weren't able to do anything. We weren't able to capture anything. You just, I swear I looked, you got to trust me. You know me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of along the same lines that we've been talking about, uh, distracted driving is just, just obviously a big issue in our industry. Distracted driving is any activity that diverts attention from driving, including talking, texting on your phone, eating and drinking, <coughs> talking to people in your vehicle, fiddling with the stereo, entertainment, or navigation system. It's anything that takes your attention away from the task of safe driving. So we, we've kind of touched already on everybody and if they're using any in-cab in uh, technology uh, to help you know, coach driver behavior. Um, let me ask you guys a question. Have you, have you had uh, the technology save you from an insurance loss? I personally, uh, we had, we had a, an employee on the freeway and another car hit him. Uh, when, when I got out to the scene, that gentleman was, was being taken away for, uh, he couldn't pass a sobriety test. And the very next day, their insurance company tried to file a claim against us, but we had already pulled the tape. And what had happened was he was nodding out and going into the car on the side of him. And that guy beeped his horn and he kind of came to and he overcorrected and came into us. But we had the whole thing on, on tape, which again, yeah. you know, you would have had to take somebody's word for it, you know, years ago. Uh, and there was no claim filed. I mean, this this could have been easily, uh, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar incident. Have you have you had any similar situations? I mean, I think I think you just said. I mean, for us, it's 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 amazing how many. I mean, if the, if a driver is at fault for backing into somebody or something like that, but it's it's the merging stuff where we have really seen the, a, a big value, um, where it's it, you know, you, it's your word against mine on the merging side of things. But if you have video evidence to show that this person merged into into your driver, uh, you know, obviously it's it, 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 it's a quick insurance fix. Um, so for us, it's it's been the merge piece that we've seen um, you know the, the, the biggest bang for uh, go ahead, I was, I was just say that's this is the reason we're actually one of the things that we're looking at at the show this year we change insurance companies in November and they offer a discount uh, for us for putting this in our uh, equipment um, and so it's one of the primary things we're looking at uh, more so in the spotlight for us because we did uh, getting off the freeway uh, we rear-ended a vehicle driver swore up and down that he uh, had slammed on the brakes and kind of cornered our truck. Uh, so we were a little suspicious about that. Uh, we let our insurance company know about it. Um, had to go back and forth quite a bit, but it turned out to be this gentleman's 15th accident with a commercial vehicle <laughs> exiting the freeway, getting rear-ended. Um, and because of that, everything was settled and it worked out for us. But had we just had the video evidence to support it from the very beginning, uh, would have made things a lot simpler. So it's one of the key things that we're here to look at this year. Yeah, it does. I mean, we've probably, since we put the camera systems in our trucks, there's probably more times than none that 
our employees were not at fault. I mean, it's actually for how many claims that we would be paying out that has defended us is from those cameras. Because, I mean, we all got good drivers. We all got good employees. Yes, some make mistakes. It does happen. But they are professional drivers. And a lot of times it's not their fault, especially, you know, it's not just our drivers that we're keeping safe out there. It's everyone else that's on their phone. I mean, these guys got guys swerving in their lanes and everything else because everyone else is on their phone or can't put out, you know, the text, the Snapchats and everything else that's out there. The phones that we all have in our hands, it's, it's gotten scary out there. And it's not just keeping our guys safe to keep them off, you know, distracted inside <laughs> that cab. They have to be extra aware of everyone else out there that's not staying in their lane because they're trying to respond to a text message. Uh, <coughs> What you said, I, I'd say far more often than not, um, yes, we have benefited. There have been, uh, and for, I'm the last person you should take legal advice from. Write that down. I, I'm not that guy. But, um, you know, the, the benefit you get in these deals is that it records everything, especially if you've got, you know, all of your cameras engaged and you got service cameras, you got rear vision cameras, you got alley cameras, you know, all these different things. You can have five or six. You almost get that 360 look in a lot of these trucks, not every truck, but... You know, the benefit is it records everything. What people worry about is it records everything. So it sees when you did everything right and they were wrong, or it sees when you were in the wrong. And it's prima facie evidence, right? It could be prejudicial right away. But I'd suggest to you, and here's where the disclaimer comes in about the legal thing, I'd, I'd say most of the time you're, you're with the proliferation of personal injury lawyers and all those kind of things, you're kind of already at a disadvantage right away. And um, the fact that it's recorded may add some, some, you know, some, something to it. But for the most part, you're already at a disadvantage. I'd say 65% of the time when we've utilized it, if not more, yeah. it's been beneficial to our, to our case. Uh, I, I would do it 10 times over again. It's the right thing to do for us. Well, I can't tell you how many people call us because their windshield got cracked yeah. or we had a customer one time when I was at WCA that they said a two by four fell out of the back of our truck and hit their car and we asked them where it hit it and they said it hit on the hood, the left side and the right side. So it became the magic two by four. But, um, magic yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank our panelists. This is our all-star group right here. Thank you guys very much.